Now in this segment we'll be discussing hemodynamic subsets in patients with acute decompensated heart failure. Now in a previous segment we discussed cardiac output, its determinants, and how that can be compromised in patients with heart failure. Now recall that in acute decompensated heart failure, the therapeutic approach in an individual patient depends on whether they have evidence of volume overload, low cardiac output, or components of both. Now based on these characteristics, patients can be classified into one of four hemodynamic subsets. Now this classification can be made based on invasive hemodynamic measure, measurements or patients' signs and symptoms. Now hemodynamic monitoring involves the placement of a pulmonary artery catheter or a PA catheter, which is often referred to as a Swan-Gans catheter. In a process known as right heart catheterization, a PA catheter is inserted into a large vein and advanced through the right side of the heart and into a branch of the pulmonary artery. Here, various pressures can be used to determine cardiac output, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and other hemodynamic measures. Now, this is generally reserved for complex patients, such as those who don't respond to initial therapy. Uh, but the routine use of PA catheters is not associated with improved outcomes and they also tend to be invasive and associated with a variety of complications. So for most patients, the classification of hemodynamic subset is made uh, based on their clinical signs and symptoms. Now starting first with volume overload. Uh, recall that patients with heart failure have a flatter Frank Starling curve due to impaired ventricular performance. Now, as a result, increases in preload in patients with heart failure uh, don't produce the same improvements in stroke volume and uh, therefore cardiac output uh, observed in normal patients. However, it does result in the signs and symptoms of volume overload, uh, and this is why optimizing volume status remains a therapeutic goal in patients with heart failure, even though it doesn't produce improvements uh, in cardiac output in the vast majority of patients. A volume status can be classified hemodynamically by the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which estimates the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, or preload. Now, although a normal wedge pressure is 8 to 12, patients with heart failure often require higher pressures to ensure adequate filling during diastole, so a cutoff of less than 18 is generally considered acceptable. Patients with a wedge pressure greater than 18 are considered congested, and therefore classified as being wet, whereas those with wedge pressures less than 18 are considered dry. Now in the absence of a PA catheter, the volume status is determined by signs and symptoms of volume overload, which include things like shortness of breath, pulmonary congestion on chest x-ray, uh, peripheral edema, or uh, jugular venous distension. Now patients are also classified according to whether cardiac output is adequate to perfuse peripheral tissues. Now previously we saw how preload can impact cardiac output, but recall that it can also be impacted by afterload, which is commonly represented as systemic vascular resistance. Now a normal SVR is 900 to 1400. A high SVR is indicative of systemic vasoconstriction, which may produce a cold state so that reductions in afterload may restore cardiac output. Now the calculation of an SVR requires the placement of a PA catheter, so sometimes the mean arterial pressure or blood pressures are used as surrogates for afterload. Alike volume status, cardiac output can be assessed both hemodynamically or clinically. Now recall that cardiac output is the volume of blood being injected by the heart over a unit of time, and cardiac index is the cardiac output that's been normalized for body size. Now a normal cardiac index is 2.8 to 4.2. Now patients with heart failure rarely have a normal cardiac index, so we often accept a goal cardiac index of greater than 2.2. Patients with a cardiac index greater than 2.2 are classified as being warm because uh, the perfusion of peripheral tissues is adequate, whereas those with a cardiac index less than 2.2 are classified as being cold. Now, in the absence of a PA catheter, inadequate cardiac output can be determined by signs and symptoms of poor tissue perfusion, such as cold, clammy extremities or uh, altered mental status, or laboratory abnormalities that are indicative of poor end organ perfusion, such as 
uh, abnormal liver enzymes, or elevated serum creatinine. Now putting this all together, using this classification scheme, patients can be classified into one of four hemodynamic subsets. Subset one, those patients are warm and dry. Uh, they're well compensated patients who are hemodynamically stable. And for them, the therapeutic strategies focus on uh, optimizing their chronic oral therapies such as ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Now for subset two patients who are warm and wet, they present with symptoms of volume overload, but their peripheral tissues are well perfused. The initial therapy consists of diuretics with the addition of vasodilators in those patients who are refractory to diuretics. And therapies such as ultrafiltration may also be considered in select patients. The management of volume overload and acute heart failure will be covered in detail in another segment. Now in subset 3, patients who are cold and dry, symptoms of low cardiac output are present, but patients do not have volume overload. Uh, in these patients, initial therapy consists of vasodilators and or inotropes. Now vasodilators are preferred initially because they have fewer adverse effects, and of those that do occur, they are often less severe than with inotropic therapy. However, unfortunately, many patients present with low blood pressures that preclude the use of vasodilators, so sometimes inotropes may be required first line. Now, the use of both of these classes in acute heart failure will be covered in detail in another segment. Now, in very rare cases, patients may be too dry, uh, and in that subgroup, they may benefit from a very gentle fluid hydration. Finally, in subset four, patients who are cold and wet, a therapy consists of a combination of diuretics, vasodilators, or inotropes uh, with adjustments uh, based on improvements in their clinical signs and symptoms of both congestion and uh, low cardiac output. Now, no matter the patient's hemodynamic subset at presentation, the goal is to optimize volume status and relieve the signs and symptoms of acute heart failure so that the patient may be discharged on a stable oral regimen.